It's more local. <laughs> Andy Bradley uh, was my co-author on a book we published in 2010 with the University of Texas Press called House of Hits, the story of Houston's Gold Star Sugar Hill Studios. Uh, which is really the focus of this session. And Andy's life history is an amazing jump from continent to continent. But I'm proud to say Andy's been in Houston for a long time now. It's getting, what, near 40 years now? 36. 36. And uh, most of those years, Andy was involved with the studio we know as Sugar Hill. Uh, he uh, was a co-owner there for a good while. Again, I'm not going to try to do all the arithmetic. And I'm really happy to have these two here because when we talk about music, Joe Nick Petoskey has made the very obvious but excellent point several times already. Historians are concerned with records of all types, birth certificates, photographs, documents, something that we can pin something down. But when we're looking at music, audio recording has given us a way to hear voices that have long gone. And Sugar Hill Studios is arguably, well, it's certainly the most historic recording studio in the state of Texas, and arguably one of the most, if not the most, uh, in the nation. It's been in operation for well over 70 years now. I've kind of lost count. Bill Quinn, start yeah. Quinn started recording year. in Houston in 39 and, and, and developed uh, by 41, he was doing music recording. And uh, we're going to be getting into all that in just a moment. Uh, but I appreciate you being here. We're going to launch right in, but with the current president of Sugar Hill Studios, Dan Workman. Uh, you see, the audience can see a photo of the entry to the studio today. This is in the address over there on Brock Street, 5626 Brock Street. Tell us what Sugar Hill Studios is today and maybe a few highlights of what's been going on there. Well, thanks. Thanks, Roger. Um, Sugar Hill is doing what it's been doing for 75 years um, throughout all, all the changes in ownership and business. Uh, it's continued to make hit records. And um, in the past year, we've had uh, Leanne Womack um, come in and actually do a country record, which is really great. We stole something from Nashville, Andy. That's excellent. Um, yeah, I know. Um, we've had uh, some amazing hip hop artists, Paul Wall and Nas have cut records at Sugar Hill. We've had in the Americana realm, Robert Ellis has done his latest uh, already award winning record. Um, we've had uh, some very esoteric groups, international groups, the Young Mothers, which is a free jazz group from uh, the Netherlands come and do their record at Sugar Hill. And then we've done tons and tons and tons of smaller projects. Yeah. So it's still very diverse. And when you hear Dan just, you know, off the top of his head, pulling a few examples out, you see one of the premises of the book that Andy and I got to work on, and that that Houston is notoriously a no-zoning city, which has its pluses and minuses. But this studio that really broke the ground of recording in a studio in Houston has always been kind of a no-zoning studio. Uh, one of the earlier slides today, we saw today for Gold Star Records, you know, it had that slogan, King of the Hillbillies on it, but then the record was by Lightning Hopkins, who wasn't exactly a hillbilly, you know, <laughs> an African-American blues artist. And so you see that kind of diversity there. And Andy was for years not just the chief audio engineer at Sugar Hill, and by the way, he's also the chief audio engineer at the Shepherd School of Music, which he will be returning to tonight at Rice University for a project he's working on there. But Andy was also kind of the in-house historian who learned a lot about this gentleman uh, named Bill Quinn. There's two Bills that are crucial audio engineers in the early recording studio uh, early recording studio history of Houston. One of them, Andy got to know, Bill Holford, and the other was Bill Quinn. And um, Andy, I know you can't see that, but that's just a text, but I'm going to show a picture of Bill. Tell, tell our audience a little bit about who Bill Quinn was and, and what his involvement in recording was. Well, he was, uh, he was an audio engineer for a Kearney, uh, and, and a Kearney. And apparently, uh, that was his forte, was, was dabbling in electronics. He apparently came to visit his sister here in Houston, and their car broke down. So no money, no car. He decided to live in Houston, and that was it for the Carney business. And then eventually he wind up starting his own uh, business, repairing TVs, repairing anything electronic, and opened up a shop on uh, Telephone Road. Um, I forget, I'd have to look in the book to actually get the address, but it's not far from the current location of where the studio is. And he started dabbling in recording on wire recorders and miscellaneous stuff like that and eventually got the bug about recording. 
and started uh, recording direct to disc, which is what was happening before tape recorders arrived in our lives. And his first hit was uh, in 1946, was the famous Cajun national anthem, Jolie Blonde. I always Harry jump Schultz. to it right there. There you see it on Gold Star Records. And again, I want you to go at this. A guy, and, and Quinn, by the way, was born in Amesbury, Massachusetts. The carnival he worked for was based in Florida. He ended up in Houston through kind of a fluke, but he thought, if I'm going to record here, what kind of music's in Houston? Well, it's Texas. It must be country and western. You know, back then they called it hillbilly music. So I'm going to record and be king of the hillbilly. His first hit was by a Cajun man singing en français. <laughs> <laughs> and his second hit was what? Lightning Hopkins Lightning doing T model Ford blues. Yeah. <laughs> T model blues. Uh, and I think we've got lightning right there. Uh, a photo of him in the studio. That photo was taken in 61 when he came back after a long hiatus. Yeah, yeah. And so Quinn has a business model. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to somehow record folks and get them out there. The studio was called Quinn Recording. Right. Uh, when the IRS nabbed him and shut him down, um, he then moved, his, the, his operation had been moved completely to the current location on Brock Street. And he simply decided to take the, the Gold Star name and since the label was no longer existing, it just it, it became Gold Star Studios. Yeah, and, and you know, Andy makes a good point that Dan might want to touch on here. I'm backing up. We're going to go backwards and forwards here. You see this photo. That's, am I correct in saying, guys, that to the left, to our left, that's the house that Quim was living in? Exactly. Exactly. And he and his family, when he closed his little shop on Telephone Road, he turned the downstairs, except for the kitchen, the downstairs became his recording studio. Essentially, the front room, the living room, dining room area became a recording studio. Uh, and he moved the family upstairs. And after some success, he added this, however we would describe this big expansion. And all of that, I'm going backwards again, is still part of what you see here. If you book time to go work with Dan, and you get let in that electronic gate, and you park your vehicle, and you stand out in the grass before you go in, you'll see the, the apex of the roof of a very old house. Right, which is the original house that was, he was living in. Yeah. Which has now been incorporated into what's now Studio A. Yeah. And in Studio A, if I remember, that's the one with the, uh, the, the big beams. timbers, the beams right. running. Those were the beams that held the second floor. All that's gone now, but they left the beams intact. If you show the picture of the four musicians outside, you can see the beam is poking through the wall. Yeah, we'll find it. There. Yeah, that's that house. I guess it's kind of, would be accurately described, kind of a stucco effect house. Stucco. It was. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was cinder block underneath it, and that's one of the reasons that they were able to build it into a recording studio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you something odd. When I was working for Billy Gibbons in 1988, before Andy and I got together, um, I built a recording studio for him, and he wanted to call it Gold Star Studios simply because of the legacy of Bill Quinn's mm -hmm. business. Um, he found that the name was protected nationally out from a, a studio in, located in Los Angeles now. But he was very aware of like what Gold Star meant to Houston. By the way, some years ago, I saw a very confused Wikipedia entry that somehow collapsed that studio in LA with Qu Quinn had the first Gold Star Studios. Right. <laughs> but after he closed, <laughs> it's somehow this Wikipedia entry confused the two. Not yeah. the first time that's happened. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, again, just uh, looking at a few examples here, we don't know who all is in here, but I think Herb Remington, whom uh, Rick Mitchell mentioned in his presentation earlier, might be one of the guys yeah, in Herb, that picture. Herb, um, and the keyboard player, his name was Doc, Yeah, was, is in there. And, and these are country western musicians. And, and certainly, a lot of country and western was recorded at Gold Star Studio in the mm -hmm. early days and has continued all the way up through more recent times. You've still done people like Clay Walker in more recent times and things like that. And then Leanne. Yeah, and Leanne Womack, yes, time. of course. Uh, We've mentioned uh, Jolie Blonde and, and Harry Schultz. We've mentioned Lightning Hopkins. Uh, there's another country singer from this area, Eddie Nowak, uh, who I think it was Joe Nick that mentioned him and his song Psycho, uh, <laughs> uh, a classic country song. But the real big breakthrough uh, after those early successes 
in country music was associated with this guy named Pappy Daly. Uh, tell us a little bit about Pappy Daly, guys. Well, the Daly family um, owned several different record labels, Starday and D Records. Uh, they used to own um, Quinn Bishop's place, uh, Cactus Records. Mm -hmm. When those of you who are old enough to remember Cactus Records when it's uh, over on Shepherd, um, they owned that record store, and it was and it was also where they marketed their product. And eventually, they've more or less gotten out of the music business. They still run a, a record label named named D Records, and they still put out the occasional product by the grandson, I think, Wes Daly of of Pappy. But Pappy was one of these typical um, entrepreneurs. Um, early on in his career, he realizes that realized that uh, the railway business, which he worked for, was not doing well. And he discovered jukeboxes, and discovered and, and got a jukebox store, and started and became a distributor for jukeboxes in, in Texas, and that's what got him onto 45 RPM records. And then he realized, hey, I can make my own records and stock my own dis jukeboxes, and started Start A Records, and enter George Jones. Yeah, and of course George <laughs> Jones is, uh, as several people have already noted today, not just a Texan, but the great country singer. And his first number one or major hit was Why Baby Why. Why Baby Why. Yeah, recorded there. And it wasn't long before Pappy Daly took George Jones on to Nashville. But Jones, who are some other country stars, names folks might recognize from this era that first recorded there, whether they had a hit or not? I remember Roger Miller, the great Roger, Roger Miller, Miller from Fort Worth, made his first recordings there. Um, uh, anyone else pop to mind? Well, besides the Big Bopper. Yeah, the Big Bopper, and we're getting to him real quick. Um, Willie recorded in 1960. Probably the second thing he ever recorded was done at, done at Sugar Hill in 1960. Yeah. Um, there's a, so many singers. Yeah. And Some of us are getting older and it's hard to remember. Hank Lachlan is oh, one Hank of Lachlan, them. Hank Lachlan, thank you. And, and by the way, one of the things I love about this historic photo, uh, Andy mentions how Daly got in the record business. He also was in the record store business. And if you go in Cactus Records today, you know, there's that big room called the Record Ranch where they have the vinyl. Maybe some of you don't go in there, but I do. Uh, why is it called the Record Ranch? Well, you, you touched on it. The Daly family uh, were the original owners of Cactus, and Pappy Daly had a store in downtown Houston called Daly's Record Ranch. On 11th Street and Heights. Oh, that's where it was, yeah. yes. 11th Street and Heights. And this is a, a shot in 49 of the great Hank Laughlin at that record store here in Houston. Really? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, a great example of how selling records to consumer, producing, owning, uh, producing records in the studio, owning jukeboxes that played records. He had really figured out how to get in on a lot of the game, as, as well as publishing, too. He developed, a, was it Glad Music is his yep. publishing company? Uh, has there been much country music beyond Lee, Lee, Lee Womack going, going on there uh, lately, or is country music mainly part of the uh, it's mainly part of the time. legacy. Yeah. And, and, you know, we had Clay Walker in the late 90s, early 2000s. And besides that, a really big country artist, we haven't had anybody since Lee. Yeah. yeah. You know, some smaller ones. But, well, don't but forget, we, we had Johnny Bush for a while. Well, Johnny's like in a class by himself. Yeah. <laughs> hard, hard to really think of him as just a country artist. Yep. This is a picture from the, the Rice Hotel downtown, the Rice Hotel ballroom oh, wow. uh, of the Sundowners. And again, I think that's Herb Remington on the left. Yeah. He was the source of many of these photos for us. The fiddles, Clyde Brewer, bless his heart, passed away on us. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Dan, tell folks who the Big Bopper is if they don't know. <laughs> the Big Bopper, Chantilly Lace. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I knew who the Big Bopper was because I knew about the song. But in, after coming to Sugar Hill, all of the inquiries that we would have, all the people that wanted to come to the studio because the Big Bopper had cut that, um, probably the most interesting one is recently we had a documentary shot at Sugar Hill called the Bopper and me, and it was about this mechanic um, that if, I'm, if I have my story straight, was living in Britain and basically spent all of his money retracing the steps of the Big Bopper across the United States. And they <laughs> brought him to Sugar Hill and had that guy actually do a recording session to make this film called the Bopper and me. It was fantastic. I mean, 
the, the degree of passion that it took for this guy to do it and then to have the documentary film you know, on board to show like, what the legacy of, of the Big Bopper really was. Yeah. Andy and I did a, uh, a, a bunch of news segments together on his anniversary. I remember yeah. seeing that, too. And some stuff for the Deborah Duncan show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And for those that don't recall, the Big Bopper was one of those folks we lost, quote, the day the music died. Right. When that plane went down with Richie Valens and uh, Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper, and uh, Waylon Jennings would have been on that plane, but gave up his seat right. famously. Uh, and the uh, uh, J.P. Richardson, the Big Bopper, was a DJ in the Beaumont area who part of his jive on the DJ was pretending like he was in a phone conversation with his girlfriend and you were only hearing his end of it. And those of you that remember Chantilly Lace, remember that's the basic premise for the song. Hello, baby, what you doing? Oh, I like that. That's what I like, you know, that kind of stuff. And so he is really one of the great examples in the 1950s of a pop hit that not only scored in the 50s, but a song that's kind of been, you know, I'm, I'm sure the publishing royalties are still coming in on that song. It's been used in movies. It's a classic American song. It has had officially three and a half million airplays. Yeah, yeah, that, that kind of product. And if I remember the story correctly, it was the flip side of what, Andy? <laughs> Nobody remembers. The, the Purple People the, Eater meets the, the Witch Doctor. Witch there were doctor. novelty songs. Didn't you remember The Witch Doctor? I told The Witch Doctor. Or The Purple People Eater? The Bopper had written a song where he was going to capitalize on these two novelty songs that other people had written. He wrote, The Purple People Eater meets The Witch Doctor. And he was sure it was going to be a hit. And was taking it to record with Pappy Daly. And he needed a B-side. And, and that's where he used his telephone jive to come up with Chantilly Lace. And the beat. The, good point. Yeah. And don't forget, he also wrote um, for Johnny Preston, uh, Running Bear. Right? Running Bear. Right. All classic songs of that era. And, uh, and by the way, Chantilly Lace was written in the, in the, uh, sitting in the back seat of a car driving from Beaumont to Houston for the recording session. <laughs> Last minute. Yeah. He phoned it in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Willie Nelson, uh, it's been mentioned previously today, his first recording of his classic song Nightlife was done in this studio when Willie was living here. And while that recording of the song remains obscure and didn't become a big hit, Willie re-recorded it later. Uh, in Joe Nick Potosky's big, thick, wonderful book, Willie Nelson and Epic Life, he points to the fact that it was during that session that Willie kind of found his signature sound, which was too, what, jazzy or R&B for Pappy Daly's it was taste? too jazzy for Pappy, so he refused to re release it. Yeah, and, uh, and, and so again, even though Willie didn't have a big hit come out of the studio, he had an epiphanic moment in that studio when this arrangement of his own composition was put down, I guess by then, down on tape, and, uh, and uh, he saw what he could do. And one of the most interesting things is the steel guitar player who plays on that record, uh, those of you that can find it, is Herb Remington, who is still with us today. Yeah, Herb Remington is a big part of the studio He's history when you think about it. 85 or 86 years old. Yeah. now and played with Bob Wills. Well, in addition to a lot of country music in the 50s and moving into the 60s, uh, Albert Collins, who was born up in uh, uh, was it Leon, Leon County, near Leona, about halfway between here and Dallas, but who as a child moved to Houston's Third Ward and lived over right at the intersection of Beulah and Velasco Streets. Uh, he recorded his, his first recording, but his first big hit, The Freeze, uh, there at Sugar Hill Studios, and then came back later and recorded an album that was issued called Trucking with Albert Collins, I believe, yep. was recorded there too. And Albert Collins, the, he, this first song he had recorded called The Freeze, uh, the recording literally happened by chance. Uh, Joe Guitar Hughes was set to do a session that day, and Joe was doing nine gigs a week, seven nights and two matinees at Shady's Playhouse in Third Ward. And because he was doing nine gigs a week, he didn't take his equipment home with him in between gigs. It'd be a lot of unnecessary hauling back and forth. And Joe was set to record with producer Henry Hayes. Uh, they, had, they had leased a few hours in Gold Star Studio, but, but the Shady's Playhouse was locked up and Joe couldn't get his guitar. And Shady's Playhouse was just down Beulah Street from where Albert lived. So Joe goes over to Albert's house Albert, I need to borrow your guitar. You can't have my, you know how musicians are about their guitars, right? <laughs> he says, well, if you're borrowing my guitar, I'm coming with you. 
And they went in and Mr. Hayes made, recorded the two tracks he had in mind for Joe Hughes. And when they got done, they were satisfied with the takes. There's still some time left. You know, we've still got another 30 minutes. Anyone got anything else? And someone said, well, Albert's got this song he's been playing out in the clubs that drives people crazy. And they said, well, why don't we do that? And that was the freeze. Mm. And those of you who are Albert Collins fans, not only was that a great recording, but it gave him his primary uh, uh, signifier because he became known as the Iceman. He recorded albums and songs with names like Frosty, Ice Picking. He, just, he, he riffed on that idea of the freeze for the rest of his career. And it, and, and, it, and it somehow, even though Houston's not exactly a town where we think of being frozen very often, that idea of ice picking really kind of applies to that, 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 that way he attacked the guitar. It's a signature sound. It yeah, is. really. Uh, there were other groups not as well known, but we have a, a, a great photo uh, of some early Texas rock band called the Jades there. I don't really know who any of those guys are. Maybe someone does. Frank, do you recognize the Jades? Uh, is that door still part of the building yes, that you've it got? Yeah, it is. It's the, <laughs> the, the door that, that faces Brock Street. Okay. All but right. It's actually, it's actually the door that's right by, uh, by the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. that, that, and uh, the actual Gold Star logo is underneath the black paint. You can still see it. Yeah, yeah. We'll move on. Uh, there's been a lot of attention paid today, and quite yeah. rightly, to uh, the Duke Peacock legacy of Houston, Texas. And in terms of uh, popularity and sales, probably Bobby Bland was their biggest artist, although they had a long roster of big artists. Uh, but Bobby Bland actually uh, made recordings at Gold Star Studio. Don Roby had a studio built at 2809 Arasta Street, but he used it more for producing demos and gospel music. A lot of his R&B and blues and pop stuff he would contract out with Bill Holford at ACA, Bill Quinn at Gold Star, or if bands were on the road, he would lease studio space in Chicago or LA and go in and record. But uh, Bland is part of that legacy too. Um, I think one of the earliest hits was Joe Hinton's. And that's where we are. Yeah. Tell us about that. That's an interesting story because Joe Hinton's first hit record was a Willie Nelson song. Yeah. <laughs> with a Joe Scott arrangement full of these big brassy horns. And so you've got this kind of syncretism of, you know, country music, Willie Nelson, the epitome uh, of, of Texas country music in our time. You've got a gospel background R&B pop singer, Joe Hinton, and then you've got Joe Scott bringing in all this brassy stuff that really makes it, uh, of the 500 recordings that I love that are on my all-time favorite list from that studio, it might be right near the top in terms of just the production values of that song. An amazing singer. Also, one of our dearest friends, Calvin Owens, played trumpet on that session. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I'll be down. And, and was right. back in that studio often later in his career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I bet some of you know Roy Head. Roy. If someone doesn't know Roy Head, introduce, introduce the audience to Roy Head. Let's see. Take... Um, Take Mickey Gillies' cousin, cousin um, <laughs> our, our friend, uh, oh, come on, guys, the uh, incredible piano, uh, rock and roll, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Take Jerry Lee Lewis and possibly amp it up a couple of notches. Yeah. And that's Roy Head. Um, Roy lives in Porter, Texas. He's age 75. Um, he cut his first number one hit record in, on January 14th, 1965, on a rainy Sunday, because I talked talk to the engineer that cut it, Doyle Jones, and uh, Treat Her Right. And Treat Her Right is a song, even if you don't recognize the title, if you're of a certain age, you know that song. Uh, uh, I remember hearing it on the radio as a kid. I don't remember the name Roy Head in, as a kid, but I remember that song very well. I bought the 45 when I was 14. There you go. <laughs> and were you living in Australia then? No, I was living in the Philippines. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and Roy Head is, is, if I remember the story correctly, in the summer of 75, that song was, was, was pushed to the top of the charts, dueling with the Beatles yesterday for that number one position. And Just to give you an idea of the impact on pop culture of the time. It was number two... Um, in the United States, behind the Beatles, and number one on the R&B charts. And by the way, a part... Huh? It was recorded at Gold Hill. At Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill. Well, it was, it was we're, we're sometimes mixing this up. We, we, should, we should do this. Let's run down a, a, a quick list of the names this place had. Quinn Recording Company was how it started. Right. Then it became Gold Star Studios. Then... Gold Star Studios to, to 1970, uh, 1978. 
Whatever. No, no, no. We're forgetting international artists in the late 60s. That's, that's 1968, I'm sorry. 1968, <laughs> it becomes international artists recording. Right. And in 1971, it becomes Sugar Hill Studios. Right. And there's been subsequent owners since Huey Moe named it Sugar Hill, and they've, I think, wisely chosen to keep that name. Right. Uh, and we're going to get to some of the subsequent ownership in just a moment. Uh, but lest you think that's all the genres that are there, I suggest you, whether you want to go look it up on your own shelf or look for it in a store that sells hard CDs or just look online, look at the Arhuli compilation called The Best of Clifton Chenier. Arhuli yeah. Records in uh, the Bay Area of California is what really made Clifton famous, took this uh, Louisiana-based, Southeast Texas refined music we call Zydeco and really took it to the world. If you look at the best of Clifton Chenier, there are, I think, 17 music tracks on that disc. And I think 11 of them were recorded at Gold Star, including the very first production that Chris Stratwitz did with Clifton, a song called I, I, I. Uh, and that's just another example of the Houston music history that came through this one studio that literally was in a guy's family home. And although that thing has been expanded and added onto, the footprint of the family home is still part of what's there. That couldn't happen in every city in America. Now today, I know anyone with a computer can record in his home. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about building a big studio. A studio big enough to, to, to sometimes host marching bands, not marching, but seated and recording, and sometimes host larger symphonic arrangements. Exactly. Uh, uh, a guy that was able to do that at that time was doing something unusual. Well, we keep mentioning Huey Moe. He's in a photo here with someone, a group called the Dogs. <laughs> Any comments on the Dogs, fella? No. <laughs> the, uh, well, the, the, the cool thing about this photo is that, uh, that Doyle Jones is the engineer. Yeah, Huey's on the far left, the right. crazy Cajun we've seen in some previous presentations. And Doyle, Doyle was a dear friend and got to interview him a lot. And he was the, he, I mean, he did, uh, he recorded uh, Roy Head. He recorded... Um, so many uh, Mickey Gillies' first hit record, um, and so many other interesting in interesting projects. And he had a studio. Uh, he moved from Sugar Hill to a studio on uh, near the corner of Blair and uh, Twenty No Fourteenth, somewhere near the corner of Blair and Fourteenth Street was where um, he mo he moved to. And it was just a, a great recording engineer. And that's the original console. The original console that was in. Oh, I wish we still had it. Yeah, and it was not there when I got there. Yep. Andy, is that in, was that oh. Studio B? That's or, Studio B. That's Studio B? Yeah. Okay. Just curious. I don't know if Joe Nick's still in the room, but Joe Nick is not only an author of many great books, a radio host, uh, a writer, and all kinds of media, but he is the uh, director of a fine documentary film that was released yet last year called, let's see if I can get the title right, Sir Douglas and the Genuine Cosmic Texas Groove. I might have got something out of line in that, but if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll get a chance to. Sir Douglas Quintet broke on the national scene with a record in 1965 called She's About a Mover. And it's, uh, I remember a few years ago, Texas Monthly had a Texas music issue where they rated, you know, some writer, picked the top 100 Texas songs of all time, and that was, came in at number one. I can remember <laughs> it as a kid when it first came out. Oh, it, it was. My, my biggest confusion was that I didn't know they were from Houston. I thought they were an English band. And, and of course, that was part up. of Huey's Roos with them. Right. And they're a Houston band comprising uh, guys mainly from San Antonio, actually, who, who came to Houston, including uh, at least two, if not three of them, were of Mexican-American heritage. But instead of calling them Doug Som and, and his band, by calling it Sir Douglas in 1965, when the Beatles and Herman's Hermits and all those things were hip, he kind of created this illusion of uh, it's part of the British invasion. <laughs> it's exactly, exactly what I thought as a kid. Yeah. There's a great little uh, clip from an interview with Bob Dylan in 1965 or so uh, that's in, in Joe Nick Potosky's film I just mentioned, where he asked a reporter at a big press conference, asked Dylan, what other groups do you like? And the one he names is the Sir Douglas Quintet. And so again, that gives you an idea of who these cats were uh, at a certain point in time. Now, I don't know if anyone knows the Pozo Seco Singers, but they had a big hit in 65 with a song called Time. Mm -hmm. Went pretty high on the Billboard charts. But probably more famously, this guy down on our left, I think that's Don Williams on the left, not the yep. right. Don Williams went on to become a major Nashville songwriter who wrote a lot of songs that other people, and then became 
for a while in the 70s, kind of a, a star in his own right. Uh, and, and still, I think, is still around doing some stuff. Yep. And this was a group from the Corpus Christi area. One thing to remember when we talk about recording history, uh, as, as much as Austin is a, you know, the, the state capital and in many ways, you know, the music city that, that folks think of when they think of Texas music these days, there wasn't a recording studio in Austin until the 1970s. There weren't recording studios in a lot of these cities. And so you had to go to a place like San Antonio or Houston to make a record uh, during these times. And these guys from Corpus came up and cut a, a big hit record there. Uh, there's been various groups named the Bad Seeds, but another one I think was also from the Corpus area, yeah, weren't they? Yeah, there's another, another uh, Corpus band. Yeah, kind of part of that whole uh, 60s garage rock, Texas music. And I didn't know about this group until I started working on the book House of Hits with Andy, and then I found some of their recordings and love them. Allmusic.com says this was the best teenage garage band of all time. Zachary a, Thax. A group called Zachary Thax. Thax. And they're worth looking up if you dig garage bands, psychedelic music. Uh, late 60s, uh, mid to late 60s group, obscure but wonderful stuff. Those of you who bought the uh, double vinyl record called Nuggets? They've got some tracks. The, the yeah. facts are in there. Yeah. This is just summing up some of the ownership changes. By 68, Bill, we're going to say he retired. There's actually some details in our book that get into the circumstances of his retirement. Uh, international artists took over. And they're most famously associated with the first band ever to use the word psychedelic in association with music. Uh, 13th Floor Elevators, an Austin band that, again, had to go to places like Dallas or Houston to cut their records. Uh, there's a picture of them. Uh, Rocky Erickson is the most famous member of the group. That's him in the front far right corner. And uh, they actually recorded their full last album there, Bull of the Woods there. Yep, and a phony live album, which was album number three. <laughs> right, that's right. A phony live album where their producer took some tracks and added in fake audience applause and stuff to create the illusion of being in a concert. And it's not, a, it's not one of their better albums. <laughs> but it's a document. It is a document, you're right. <laughs> and speaking of Texas psychedelic music, the one that had the biggest hit at the times was Bubble Puppy. Does anyone remember Bubble Puppy? Oh, yeah, I do. Hot Smoke and Sassafras. <laughs> now, again, that's one of those songs. You might not know the title, but if you were listening to the radio in the 60s and you heard the opening riffs of that song, you'd go, hell, I know that song. Uh, a, a, a song, if I remember the oral history correct, a, a song whose title came from the guy's... Uh, maybe uh, taking a break and getting high and watching the Beverly Hillbillies on TV where Jethro comes in and says, well, hot smoke and sassafras, Granny. And he said, that'll be the title of this song that we're, we're working on. I've talked to the guys in the band. <laughs> it's an accurate story. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's an interesting connection. Uh, the word psychedelic was uh, uh, allegedly at least coined by the British writer uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, who had a profound influence on psychedelia. You know, the, the, the L.A. group, The Doors, took their name from Huxley's famous phrase about the doors of perception. Uh, uh, Bubble Puppy, I believe, took its name from an, uh, an odd Aldous Huxley, Huxley phrase, too. Uh, here we're moving on to 72. Be before you hit that, one must tell everybody the story. Um, Hot Smoke only made it to number 13 because the, the record company refused to bow into the mafia and pay all the necessary money for that to be taken to number one. <laughs> and I, I no won't payola on that one? There was no payola on no that payola. one. That's why it stopped at number 13 and never made it to number one. And, that should be, and that's something that should be documented that th the music business is bad. <laughs> it still is today. It, it still is today. You have to pay people to get number one hits, and that's still happening in 2016. Here's a summary of Mo taking over the studio and renaming it. We've touched on that already. I'm seeing. We'll move along here. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment, but this is Huey Mo, Leo Neal, Mickey Moody. Uh, Leo was a musician. Mickey Moody was another of the great Ace Engineers. Yep. And Love Leo, Mickey's glasses, right? And Leo O'Neill is still with us today. He's well into his 80s and uh, was an amazing arranger. He used to work for Dr. John, um, famous Mac Rabinac from New Orleans. And uh, they were obviously working on one of, probably working on one of Freddie Fender's albums there. Um, and that's, they, they were the crew that helped propel Freddie Fender into, you know, 20 top 40 hits. Yeah. 
If we were only able to talk about one musician in Sugar Hill history, in terms of impact on larger popular culture, I think it would have to be Baldemar Huerta, who was known by the stage name Freddie Fender, uh, and who had first been known as El Bebop Kid, uh, doing Spanish language covers of pop rock songs from the United States and selling a lot of copies of that stuff uh, south of the border, but whose career was reborn when he came to Sugar Hill right. and worked with Mo and recorded that song before the next teardrop falls that went to number one and then followed that up. You can see some of the summary. There's many stories to tell there and unfortunately we don't have time, but a whole lot of hits. The, I'll give you the quick, the, the, the most interesting one was the fact that uh, before the next teardrop falls was the first pop and country hit ever. It was, yeah, if I remember this right, it was the first song ever to be number one on the country charts and the pop charts in the same week. By the way, it was also the first country number one song ever to be bilingual. Because famously in that song, the song came from Nashville. It was written by some Nashville songwriters. And famously in that song, uh, Freddie Fender chooses to sing the second verse in Espanol. And I've always, since I've thought about it at least, I've always thought that's part of the power of that song. Uh, the song had been recorded many times in Nashville and never registered, never had a hit, went nowhere. And Freddie, Freddie records, and of course, we do have to acknowledge he had a, a really great voice. But singing that second verse in Spanish added an element that I think not only spoke to an obviously larger audience, but made it more appealing to all audiences at the time. And he, and he played off that formula and a lot of stuff he followed up with on, at Sugar Hill. Uh, and again, Freddie was famously associated with Doug Somm. Uh, We've touched on him earlier. I'm going to move along. We, Dr. John actually came back and recorded with Huey there in the 70s. Nothing that, that, none of the famous songs you associate with Dr. John, but recorded quite a few tracks there for Huey. A lot of folks don't know this. You probably know who Lucinda Williams is. Uh, she was really famous uh, a few years back when on the cover of Time magazine, I think it was the year 2000 or so, they called her America's Greatest Songwriter when her album Car Wheels on a Gravel Road was hot. The first recording she ever made of her own material was at Sugar Hill, and Mickey Moody produced that. 1980. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, great example. And this is summing up some of the, the subsequent ownership. Uh, Mo sold out in 86. Uh, it was bought by MMV, Modern Music Ventures, uh, that had a lot of stuff, uh, in the, particularly in the Latino market. Yep. Uh, what uh, with uh, Disco Sony or yeah, something? Yeah, I had a, a number of hit records with Elsa Garcia um, when they signed her up. Um, uh, Jerry Rodriguez, a, a couple of other artists, and the hometown boys. And, were and the hometown bo then then came the hometown boys when the when the whole conjunto thing came back. Yeah. Um, and while all that was going on, I had the privilege of working with groups like La Fiebre, with uh, Emilio Navarra. I had a bunch of hit records with those guys, and. Uh, became really good at recording Chicano music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in, in 97, the property was sold to the RAD partnership. And one of the things I learned about this acronym, the A in RAD, I think, stood for a Andy, and the D stood for Dan. And the R was what, Rodney? Rodney. Rodney. Yeah, yeah. Rodney the three Myers. partners that took over at that time as owners and worked together for a long time. Some of the projects they did included uh, this uh, recording down at the Wortham Theater of Dizzy Gillespie, Arnett Cobb, and, and uh, the great Jewel Brown. Uh, there uh, we have the Hometown Boys. Uh, I, I don't remember if the Hometown Boys were, was that after Rad took over? I, I, that's where they fall yeah, in their after. secrets. Is that when they after? Yeah. That's a, that's and you know, Robert that's Rodriguez, before, he's yeah. still here. You know, these, these were some of your mentors, weren't they? Yeah, exactly, man. That, that young man you saw playing the accordion so proficiently earlier today, these are the guys that, that really turned him on to the technique. And then this is Houston, and this is the place where Destiny's Child launched its career, and while Matthew Knowles went on to, uh, to build a studio over at his property at Hadley Street and to do other things, Dan, you were involved in some of these sessions, weren't you? Yeah, my wife was working as studio manager at the time, and she said, I've got this guy on the phone, and he's got a girl group called Destiny's Child and wants to book time. Have you ever heard of them? Because he's, he's insisting that we should know who they are. And I was, I didn't. I didn't know who they were at all. And uh, he drove Beyonce over because she was too young to drive herself and dropped her off. And uh, by the end of the session, I knew she was extraordinary. Yeah. You know, maybe one of the very best voices I'd ever produced. And we went on to 
record uh, The Writings on the Wall, which is the second Destiny's Child album, as well as Survivor, the third and final Destiny's Child record. And you actually played guitar on her first solo hit. Yeah, I did. I yeah, did. we'll skip over Clay Walker and go to Beyonce here. I remember <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we can do that. Dangerously in Love, 2003. Right. Is that, yeah. And That's the one that I played guitar on. Yeah. Um, and got, got the privilege of playing guitar on that. As a matter of fact, I called up Matthew and I told him, you know, the guitar playing on this is really, really bad. And I know somebody that can do a better job. And uh, I mean, it was kind of bold on my part, but I thought like, hey, you don't, you don't ask, you don't get, right? And uh, he said, yes, you can do it. And I spent about 12 hours trying to do 20 bars of guitar playing to make sure that it was perfect. <laughs> well, you must have done something right, man. I did. Now, um, I want you guys to... In that one case, yes, you're right, I did. You know, think back to 1941 when Gold Star really gets going recording music and you're working with people like Harry Schultz and Lightning Hopkins and some of those early country guys and move through all that you've just seen sample glimpses of. We've left out lots of people whose music you know here. So all the way up to someone like Beyonce Knowles, uh, her first hits there and her group Destiny's Child, some of their most famous material was recorded there too. Uh, and I think our last photo here is someone close to Andy. Aww. Just give him a quick sense of who Calvin Owens is. Andy? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. They were very close. Calvin Owens was born in Fifth Ward in 1929 in a neighborhood called Sawdust Alley. Went to Wheatley High School, became a master trumpet player. By the time he was 17, he was in the house band at the Eldorado Ballroom. Went on the road with B.B. King twice, including a long stint as B.B. King's band leader. Got tired of being on the road with B.B. King 300 days a year. Married a Belgian woman and settled in Belgium for 12 years. And in 1998, said, I'm going home. Came back to Houston. And from 1998 up to his death, was working on an album with Andy. I did 10 albums starting in 2002 with Calvin. Yeah. And uh, one of the last projects includes Barbara Lynn. And Barbara yeah. Lynn, if you don't remember the name, uh, boy, I wish I could sing it. But, you know, if you lose me, you'll lose a good thing. That 1961 classic pop R&B hit. That was Barbara Lynn of Beaumont who came in to record there. And that was produced by UMO, too. Yeah. Yeah. And we've just given you a little taste of uh, what's going on there. Uh, the book that Andy and I were privileged to write, House of Hits, tells the complete story. We hope you've enjoyed this. We're trying to get caught up in time since the conference is running late, and we're going to nip it here. Thank All you right. very much. from a fire hose, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy and Dan and Roger. We really enjoyed that. You're very welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Actually